let's just move yourselves over to the side for a minute. This winter, one of Britain's busiest NHS trusts opened its doors. We have to look after the patients, whether they come from Buck Palace or the park bench. To show us what's really happening inside our hospitals. We've got lots of patients now competing for an unknown number of beds. Every week, more than 20,000 people are treated here. The pressure's just gone. What? Is it completely gone? And the numbers, as well as our expectations, are rising. We've just had our worst 10 days on record. There's nowhere in the hospital to move anybody. I mean, at some point, somebody will be telling us whether we're allowed to do any work. This is a place with some of the best specialists in the world. Tumors out, job done. Where lives are transformed. This is saving his life. It has to work. But they are operating at a time when the NHS has never been under more pressure. Do you need beds? No. Yeah. beds for you, Yeah. OK. It does feel to me like the elastic's a bit nearer to breaking now than it ever was. It's very future under scrutiny. All right, I think we will go out on red because we're under real pressure in the emergency department. We're aware of the problems. <laughs> Anybody got a solution? Following the patients from the moment they are admitted... Anything I've done up to this point means nothing compared to when you can literally give a bit of yourself to save someone else. ..to the moment they leave. It's all good news. The cancer's gone. You don't need any more treatment. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Week by week, we reveal the complex decisions the staff must make about who to care for next. That patient is coming to me to be operated on. And if I don't do it, then there's only one inevitable outcome. They're going to die. Just been brought in by ambulance, onset of stroke symptoms. Jerry, just look at me. Keep your eyes open nice and wide. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Jerry, look at me. Can you see me all right? 87-year-old Jerry has been brought into Charing Cross Hospital after suffering a stroke. Jerry, can you see my hand waving? A medical emergency that occurs when the blood supply to part of the brain is cut off. Jerry, open your eyes and look at me. Family just suddenly saw him go. I got a telephone call from my son to say Dad wasn't well, come home quickly. Just one look and I knew what was happening. Jerry, same on the right. Jerry is being looked after by doctors from the hospital's acute stroke unit. As soon as this is in, can you book it? Seventy percent of their patients are over 65. The longer you wait to try and restore blood flow to a part of the brain that's been affected, the more brain cells or neurons will die. Hi there, are you family? Wife. OK. He's never had a stroke as far as you're aware? No. He's never had any brain surgery? No, no. He's never had a brain hemorrhage before? No. We need to rush, and the first thing we need to do is to do a brain scan. This has all been quite slow. Let's speed up a bit. We want to get treatments into Jerry as quickly as possible. Uh, Riddell, do you want to run ahead and tell CC we're coming? Well done, Jerry. You're doing OK. We're going to do a quick scan of your head, which is quite important. Sorry, guys. I have a stroke call. We called up, they said, come up. OK, what do you want to do? It's going to take about five minutes. Yep. All right, let's get this done. One, two, three. As a stroke patient, Jerry has priority for the CT scanner, so doctors can quickly decide if he's suitable for an emergency treatment known as thrombolysis. Yep. He's late 80s, he's got no neurological history. We really need to look at the scan, and then we'll make a decision. There are no contraindications, so we should just go ahead and give thrombolytic therapy. I'm going to go downstairs to make sure family are happy. Jerry is a candidate for thrombolysis, which is a medical injection that is aimed to break down a blood clot. Giving thrombolysis to the wrong patients can cause hemorrhage uh, or bleeding. And that hemorrhage can be life-threatening and can even cause death. Um, Riddell, can you get the thrombolysis ready? I'm ready already. Come and, come and sit down for a while, OK? Jerry's just having the last few scans. Uh, there's no bleeding into the head, as far as we can tell, so it looks like this is a stroke that's been caused by a blood clot. 
And the best course would be to give him this clot busting treatment. However, it's also important to know it's not a miracle cure no. at all. One of its uh, most serious side effects is bleeding. And that bleeding could potentially be life threatening. I think you know, we've got to understand that all treatments can go. Yes. I trust you. Sure. Okay. And he's then, and he's in safe, as far as I'm concerned, he's in safe hands. Sure. All right. I'll be with you soon. Would you time two minutes for me and just give a 30 second updates? That's one minute. Okay, well done. It's just such a shock, but he's 87, and we know that it's inevitable that something's going to happen at some point. Age is a very strong risk factor for stroke, so with an aging population, you'd expect the incidence of stroke to rise. Every year that goes by, we're feeling incredibly stretched. We don't want standards to drop, and it feels like standards are slipping. Okay, well done. It will be several hours before Jerry's wife, Margaret, knows how well he's responding to treatment. Along with Charing Cross, Hammersmith is one of the five hospitals that make up Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. Retired carpenter John requires an operation to replace a valve in his heart. If you're on the top floor, you might have a nice view. Mm. John's procedure, known as a TAVI, a transcatheter aortic valve importation, will be conducted by consultant cardiologist Iqbal Malik. A TAVI is a way of deploying a new valve inside the heart without cutting the patient open too much. It's an insane thing to even consider, isn't it? A squashed valve goes into an artery. While the patient's awake, you track back to the heart and pop the new valve into position. The patient goes home the next day. That's something that would have been ludicrous to consider 10 years ago. I saw you in 98. And a half. And a half. <laughs> You've never had a stroke? No. You don't have diabetes? No. You don't look 98. Thank you. Age is just a number, you see. Yeah. <laughs> At 98, John will be the oldest patient ever operated on by the TAVI team. Some of the team is nervous that we'll be seen as lunatics doing a 98-year-old. Well, I don't think so. I'm the leader of the team. I don't think so. I don't care. You know, they can, they can do what they like. I bet you when it's their granny, they'll be asking for a 98-year-old to have their TAVI done. Have you done any other 98-year-olds? That, that would be a no, I think. I think we're, we're not far off it. I think we've done 95, but... Um... Yeah. And just survived. <laughs> they did, yes. Let's go through the case. Uh, so he's 98. We know his creatinine's 200. It hasn't changed. The renal team's seen him. Don't want to do anything particular. The average age for Tavi is 80. So these are patients who can't have open heart surgery. And a number of years ago, we couldn't offer patients anything. So now we're in a privileged position in, uh, of offering Tavi to these um, elderly patients. He's got so much more in him. He's still so full of life. <laughs> my grandparents are my favourite people in the entire world, so... <laughs> I'm sure it's the same for everyone. How many times have you been to hospital before in your life? I had some varicose veins out... Uh, um, oh, when I was... Oh, it was 50 years ago now. That was the last time you've been. Yeah. He's incredible. At the age of 87, he walked up to Sebius. Um, I think he only stopped running races against me and my brother around the age of 90. And he would, he would try and win as well. This wasn't like he was trying to let us win. She says, I haven't done anybody in my age before. But it's not about age, it's what we were saying to you before. It's not just about age, it's about how fit you are otherwise. You'll be running out of here. <laughs> Three choices. Give it up, give in, or give it your all. It's now a good time to ask you what you'd like for Christmas. 
I'd like to be alive. <laughs> Mr. Rowland. Hi, Dr. Hello, Malik. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. OK, so um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. We've been through the risks before. Yeah. You know what we're talking about, but yeah. I will double check that you do understand. Yeah. Just as a short memory test, what is the problem that you had with your heart? Well, getting out of breath very quickly, you know. But yeah. Couldn't walk very far. OK. In terms of risk, yeah. if we did 100 cases, OK, then about five of them would have a bad problem. One in 20. Yeah, and that yeah, problem... If they have a problem, it would mean they'd be, death, they'd be dead. stroke, bleeding, heart attack. OK, is that, is that an acceptable level of risk for you? Yeah, well, I haven't much alternative. OK, what's your date of birth, John? March 1918. 1918, oh, my goodness. OK, and can I just get you to sign on the dotted line, John, mm -hmm. if you're up for having this procedure done? It's a miraculous treatment for the older patients that we couldn't treat before that we're now treating. Every cardiologist would hope to have one really important step that has suddenly changed in their lifetime that they can experience. And I think for me, at the age of 50 now, it's Tavi. Demand for heart valve procedure Tavi has tripled at Hammersmith in the last three years. What, the old valve? The yellow valve? John is the second of these patients on Iqbal's list today. The first is a patient in their 80s. Is that pressure real again? Okay. Are you calling? Rex. It's an so it's bleeding too much, so he thinks he might want to open. OK, okay so this is an unexpected complication of the first procedure. The first case hasn't gone according to plan because there's been some bleeding internally. Tavis, you can't <laughs> quite predict what's going on. Normally, they're very straightforward, and this is the first for the year where we've had uh, a major complication. It's now likely that the patient will need a post-operative intensive care bed. But that means one won't be available for 98-year-old John if his operation runs into trouble. I'm trying to find another bed. Sometimes if they've got any capacity here, we can use one of their intensive care beds as a backup, a fallback um, for the next case. Hello, Hi are you there. the boss? I am today, yes. You may have heard we had a bit of an um, emergency in the first procedure yes. today. Yeah. We've therefore lost our ICU bed, but we have a second tabby. Yeah. We need a fallback critical care bed because he's, so he's, he's 98, yeah. otherwise quite well, no previous surgeries. We're full at the moment, 16 patients in 16 bed spaces. I'm sure two of the patients were going to go, and I think one was a cardiology patient. So, so I the deal is we have to take one back? Yeah, there'll be a degree of swapping. OK. We are in some difficulty in there. The uh, bleeding's restarted, and therefore we can't really uh, think about other cases. We have uh, a senior surgeon operating, but I think the rest of the day in this particular lab is, uh, is not going to be working out. I think we're going to have to cancel the tabby. This is just yeah. not realistic. We're not even ready now, and by the time he gets on, it'll be four. By the time we finish at six, if something goes wrong at six, we are much less covered, so uh, I think it's safety first. Mm. Operating out of hours on elective cases that are high risk is not clever. I think if it all went well, I'd be finished by five. You know, I think that's fine. But actually, if it didn't go so well, then the complication is being managed out of hours with, you know, less team around. I think it's unfortunate. So, old father time has defeated us. So, I, I don't exactly, just your luck. But the, uh, the thing that's destabilized us is a very rare eventuality. Yeah. So, sorry about today, OK? I'm going to get them to give you a cup of tea, give you some food, because we've kept you starved all day. OK? OK. Uh, OK, so I'm just coming down now. Yeah. It's something I wasn't expecting. I was almost certain that it was going to happen today. Uh, but what can you do? We know that there is a risk to doing the procedure, 
but we were told by the cardiologist without this operation, he has a 50% chance of sudden death. John will have to come back next week for another attempt at the procedure. Maureen, I like shows like Casualty, Holby City, House, Grey's Anatomy. I like stuff like that because I like to be a children's nurse and help people like me. How are you doing? How are you okay. doing? Good. The Trust's Paediatric Centre offers pioneering treatments for patients up to 19 years old. Just lift that up for me a little bit here. Debbie was diagnosed with sickle cell disease when she was three. Sickle cell, it's like a blood disorder. It causes pain in the joints and your arms and your knees and your legs, but it can affect any part of the body, really. Can I pop this here? but more severely, your brain. It can cause strokes and neurological problems. And that's what happened to me. That's when they considered that I need, like, a transplant so that I don't get any more damage to my brain. The only cure for sickle cell disease is a bone marrow transplant, which 18-year-old Debbie has been waiting for since 2009. A standard yeah. bone marrow transplant requires the donor's tissue type to be a 100% match. Doctors have been unable to find Debbie a suitable donor, but a new treatment is offering her a lifeline. Sally, how is Deborah today? Not feeling very well. Would you mind giving me her chart so I can have a look at it? In normal circumstances, were you to do a 50% uh, mismatch transplant, that will uh, almost certainly uh, lead uh, to the patient dying from the newborn marrow attacking the body of the patient. But we now have a method which will enable this newborn marrow, which is only 50% mats, not to be rejected by her body. This new method allows Debbie's 22-year-old brother, Sam, to be her donor even though his tissue type is only a 50% match with hers. Um, I'm here to see Debbie. Right, Debra, um, oh, 13. Yeah. What way, that way? Or... Bless her, because of the illness, she hasn't had that 18-year-old life at all. So if I can give her a chance, a fighting chance, to um, obviously never have to be in that condition again or go through all the crisis she's been going through again, because She's got so much to catch up on and so much more to do. And I remember when we used to go to the same primary school, me always looking out for her, like going into the younger playground to see if she's all right. So luckily enough, that was a close match. Debbie. Oh. Have you been worrying about things? OK, because all that worry is for us, OK? It's not only that when her dad you... is not here, she's worried. She's worried, OK. She oh. wants me to be here 24-7. <laughs> At the moment, this type of transplant for sickle cell disease is only funded for um, children and young adolescents up to the age of 19. And then you have some more of the mesna, which is the kidney protection, running afterwards. Is there a risk of death with this type of bone marrow transplant? Yes, there is a risk of death. And the risk does go up with the degree of mismatch um, of the donor. However, as current situation stands, this is Debbie's last chance to get her bone marrow transplant. They said it will come with loads of risks, but I just want to have it so that I can continue with my life. Jerry. Hello. How are you feeling now? <laughs> it's two and a half hours since stroke patient Jerry was brought into A and E. Best of you, Jerry. What year is it now? Oh, I don't know. Don't worry about that. That's fine. 
Touch my finger. See my finger? Jerry, can you see my finger there? Yeah. Touch your nose. Perfect. How old are you? 87. Do you know what day it is today? Thursday, yeah. Good. Lift up your leg. Okay, five seconds. One, two, three. They have saved us here. They've got Jerry moving again. They've got him talking again. The change is remarkable in such a short space of time. How are you feeling, Jerry? I think you're going to do fine, but we need to keep you in hospital for a few days. Okay. We'll pop in a bit later on, okay? Okay. Nice to see you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Jerry will recover at Charing Cross Hospital's Hyperacute Stroke Unit, or HASU, one of eight specialist stroke centres in London. The thing that everyone worries about as someone who's had a stroke is they're at risk of having another stroke. So he's not out of the woods at all. We're going to have to closely monitor him. He's got very powerful medication on board. Things look promising. Let's keep our fingers crossed. I'm going to put it over the top because it will be finished before that, probably. 18-year-old Debbie is preparing for her bone marrow transplant by receiving chemotherapy to deplete her immune system. Chemotherapy just makes you feel completely lifeless. You don't want to eat. It makes you feel so sick. Like you've got no energy whatsoever and you just can't do anything. Hey, Dad. Yeah. How is she? Oh, it's horrible seeing her like this, though. <sighs> I know. I'm here. How are you feeling? Mm. Oh, I didn't realise it was to this extent. Yeah. Debbie. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. I'll see you soon, yeah? Nice. That was uh, very difficult to see. Never seen her like that, ever. Ever. And I've never really heard her say she feels not good. Even if she don't feel good, she'll say she feels all right, do you know what I mean? She was always very optimistic, but obviously the chemo has obviously left her, rendered her into that sort of state, hasn't it? So it's very hard, <laughs> very hard to see. Debbie is traveling to Hammersmith Hospital, where she will receive a high dose of radiation. Are they on their way? Right, great, thanks, bye. It's the last stage of treatment before her transplant. Hi, Deborah. My name's Faye. I'm one of the radiologists doing your treatment today. We're going to be uh, putting some little measuring devices onto your skin. Just do a small little dose first, and then once we're happy, we'll then do the, the main part of the treatment. You OK? Do you want some water? <coughs> no. It's a headache. The whole thing is a bit like a Trojan horse. We're trying to get past the guards. See you in a bit, Deborah. If we don't do it, then there would be a lot of reaction between the two immune systems, one of Debbie's and one of the newborn marrow. And we've got a gallantry of mm -hmm. 270, coils of zero, mm -hmm. jaws of 40 on the Y, 25 on the Xs, yeah. and we've checked all covered. Yeah. Bolus and diodes are ready. We're good to go, yeah? Mm Seem very well at all. Has she been like this just today or it's about a week now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I feel for her. I can't recount how many times I've rushed Debra in the middle of the night to hospital. She's just very nervous about today. So not knowing, isn't it? It's like lateral. 
It has been a very, very rough and long journey. I've been looking after her since her mother left 11 years ago. Okay. I feel for her because it has been a struggle. But Dr. De La Fonte said the bone marrow transplant success rate in his hands is very high. That's what he said, and I believe his word. Deborah, how are you? How are you, darling? Not well. Do you have pain in your in your eyes when you look at me? Debbie's immune system is now so depleted, even a mild virus could kill her. Would you mind if I quickly touch your tummy? Mm. Will that be okay? You can see that, uh, though it is fantastic that we are now able to carry a transplant, the truth is that the treatment itself is very tough. So I have a little bit of cold hands. The doses that we use in transplantation are far higher than you would use usually in the treatment of cancer. And so the number of side effects these children suffer and these young people suffer is substantial. Okay. It's a difficult time. Okay, we'll leave you in peace. All right. Thank you. So we are going to attend the TAVI multidisciplinary team meeting, which is a meeting we have every week, essentially, to discuss um, all cases that we are considering for the TAVI procedure. For a second time, consultant cardiologist Gardy Mikhail is preparing for 98-year-old John's heart valve procedure. So it's multidisciplinary, it's attended by cardiologists, surgeons, echo imaging doctors, CT doctors, so all the TAVI team. OK, good morning. So uh, the first case is Mr John Rowlands, 98. This case was the case that we were supposed to do um, last week and it got cancelled, so we're just rediscussing him because he's booked... Can I just ask first? Yes, so, 98. 98. You need to persuade me that there yes. is no frailty. Can we just re-review the echo and the LV function? Sansa, do you want to take us through the echo? Sure, so, um, yeah. In many ways, we are, and the NHS is a victim of its own success, so we have so many LV patients now. Um, and we are getting into discussions about life expectancy when patients are already in their 90s. Hang on, he's got TR, but the PA pressure was up as well with a good ventricle. What, how do you explain that? Overall LV function looks preserved. With the TAVI MDT, it's particularly difficult because this is a high-risk group of patients. Cost does come into it. So I have a responsibility to manage the resources effectively. But actually, we try and pick the winners on clinical grounds, and we have to decide does he have enough reserve to come through the procedure? Because I'm afraid it is the case that you can have uh, an outcome which is a fate worse than death. So it is quite challenging. I mean, 147, is that a, a recent so change? Or? He's had increasing shortness of breath over the past um, six months. Six months ago, apparently, he was walking about four miles, and now he can only walk about 200 metres. He's never smoked. He's got good lung function. Um, with severe aortic stenosis and slightly raised pulmonary artery pressures. Um, he's got a very supportive family as well who are all sort of on board with the tally. He's just very keen to have something done. He wants to continue living and have a good quality of life and wants to be less symptomatic, but he's not low risk at 98. He's not going to be low risk. I'd want a clear statement that he understands that as well. The last conversation we've had with him, he will accept risk just to feel better. OK, fantastic. So he's all set. We can't be ageist. We are dealing with an ageing population. And he wants a better quality of life. We can't deny uh, a patient uh, that, no, ma no matter what their age is. You don't need to go quickly. We can just take our time. Enjoy the sense of deja vu. A week after he was first cancelled, John is back at Hammersmith Hospital. You couldn't possibly say anything about quantity of life, how long we'll make him live, but he's a very active 98 and his quality of life has really got worse. It's very important that he's up for it, his family is up for it, and the team is up for it. So, can you just look up uh, uh, John Rowland's blood results? Is that if any of the team had dissented, then we'd think again. Yes. 
You want to sit on the chair, Grandad? Okay. Are you happy to be having the operation? Yeah. I'm not. I'm not happy to be having it, but uh, what's the alternative? Because I'm getting worse all the time recently, and I can only walk about. I, I used to walk miles, and now I can only walk a couple of hundred yards, and I'm a, out, out of wind. I am genuinely terrified that something might happen to him because I can't, honestly, can't bear the thought of life without my granddad in it. Just about waiting now, isn't it? Even their price is waiting. <laughs> she's, uh, she's waiting for it to happen. I am very, very, very nervous. Because at the end of the day, it's just got to be, it's just got to work. 22-year-old Sam is donating his bone marrow in an attempt to cure his 18-year-old sister, Debbie, of sickle cell disease. So he's been consented for a mobilization with GCSF injections for, for stem cells and to undergo a bone marrow harvest under sedation on theater. All right, Samuel, do you know why you're here today? To donate bone marrow to okay. my little sister. OK, Lovely. we're good to go. I'm starting with something. It's not the anesthesia yet, but it's just something to relax you a bit, OK? What are you thinking about, Sam? I don't know. I'm just scared, like, all these machines, and I just want it to go well. Anything I've done up to this point means nothing compared to when you can, when you can literally give a bit of yourself to save someone else. Now that's doing something, that's responsibility. Okay, ladies. The harvesting of bone marrow from Sam's hips is being conducted by an expert team at Hammersmith Hospital's Centre for Hematology. Okay, ready, steady, move. When we do the bone marrow harvest, the areas that we need are the uh, posterior iliac crest, which are just the bones that you will feel on the bottom of your back. And that is the exact place where we have to sort of put the needle through and extract the marrow. The whole process will last less than two hours. So with his white cell count of 58, we have to collect 700 mils. So we're taking five mils per syringe. Yes, yes please. Yeah, so we can put in the bone. At the end of the day, it's just the gift of hope. You know, it's just the gift of life. It's quite similar to, to blood. So you wouldn't be able to sort of distinguish. Before Sam's bone marrow can be transplanted into Debbie, it must be tested in the haematology lab. One of the big requirements of the whole process is that the, pro the product is sterile and free of contamination. So before we do any processing with the harvest, we take some blood cultures just to make sure that the product that we got from Sam was harvested in a sterile way and then that there's no microbial contamination. Hi, Deborah. Are you all set? Uh, yeah. 15 years after being diagnosed with sickle cell disease, Debbie is receiving the new bone marrow that could cure her. Uh, so these are your cells. Picture of it. Yeah, you can. It's all your brother's bone marrow. Cool. It's just like a blood transfusion. Debbie's half match transplant has the 
risk of rejection. So the body rejects literally the, the new tissue. So you're going to have 15 drops in 15 seconds. Okay. However, 90% of the children have um, not only survived the transplant, but also been cured of their, of their underlying disease. How long will it be? Um, it will be about three and a half hours. But unfortunately, some complications can never be completely prevented. It will be a few weeks before doctors know if the bone marrow transplant is a success. But this one will end the all crisis. It's a rather large box. It says, yeah. <laughs> What's inside, Angela? It's going to be John's new heart valve. John's new heart valve has been shipped to Hammersmith from the United States. It comes with lots of um, important kit to try and help us make it small enough to fit inside the body. So that's the actual valve itself. And we need to check we've got the right size. 26 valve, and it's the correct size we've got there. The valve itself is the most expensive part. These TAVI valves cost anywhere between 12 and 18,000 pounds. And then there's a the time taken for the procedure. And so I think if you wrapped up all of that, you probably wouldn't get much change from 30K, I would think. But it's cost effective because if he came in heart failure, he's likely to stay two weeks on the first admission, probably 10 days on the second admission. If he makes it to a third admission, it's probably another two weeks. You can see that very quickly, we've got to be on 30 days at £1,000 a day, and uh, we're then going to be in credit. So uh, we're not spending £30,000 on a patient because we fancy it. We're spending £30,000 not only to help him and his symptoms, but I would have a very strong argument that that is actually going to save the NHS money in the long run. OK, Iqbal, the operator. God, the other operator. Danny, anaesthetic nurse. Julia, anaesthetic fellow. G and nurse. OK, fantastic. So there's a large team around. Good, good, good team. Good, a good, very good team. Thank goodness. OK. A lot of brains in this, lot must be. Yeah, a lot of brains, exactly, a lot of brains. Some of them working as well. So, uh, so OK, so we've got your name sorted out. The procedure, it's a transfemoral TAVI. Uh, right leg is the main access, uh, 26 millimeter S3 valve. We've just checked that all, OK. So, John, the, you're part of the team. So we need to keep you nice and still. John will be awake throughout the procedure. Are you ready? OK, that's that pipe in. So, John, we're just making a track for our big pipe to go in. Hopefully he's not too uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Have a pair of forceps. Basically, what we're doing is we're going through the right femoral artery, which will lead us yep. up into the heart. Now, once the big pipe is in, we're pretty much committed to the valve, and so that's the time we take the valve. It's prepped over on the other table. So that's what the valve looks like, and that's the uh, three cusps. We squash yeah. the valve in to something the size of a big biro. Um, and then as soon as we're ready to go, they'll hand it over to us, we can put it in. Can I have the wire? Yep. And, um, the, the clip. We'll just take the clip. So a bit of pushing now, John. A bit of pushing. So it's quite a tough push because uh, uh, the valve is a bit like a goat in a boa constrictor. It's expanding as we go. All right, John. Well. Yeah. All right, you're doing very well. Right. Okay, so everyone quiet. So ready to floor record. Pacing on. Balloon up, balloon up, slowly, 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 slowly. Balloon down, pacing off. Okay. The pressure back. Okay, let him recover. Okay, so there's the new valve here. It's in very good position, which is good. And we're going to put some colour on that. Oh, look at that amazing flow. Going forwards without turbulence, no leak coming backwards that we can see. Okay, well done. We've done this, uh, well, nearly 300 times, so uh, it's like a Formula One pit stop, isn't it? Hello. Talk to me, Kyle. Oh, it's all done. We're all finished. It's all gone very well. All right. Do you want to look to the right? 
just a bit slow to respond. Very, very slow. John? 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 All right. You still with us, John? 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 Hello there. There we go. Hi, John. I don't like that yawning. And the, the yawning can be a marker of uh, a stroke or something happening. Uh, the case is not over, I'm scrubbing back in. Most of the time nothing happens, our stroke rate is very low, probably about one, one and a half percent. But absolutely for every patient, including me if I was a patient, if, uh, if I'm dead, I don't really care. If I'm alive with a big stroke, I'm pretty annoyed about the whole situation. Um, so, uh -huh. uh, a stroke is not our biggest concern, but a stroke is not good. John, just repeat your name for me. Can you do that? Okay. Tell me your name. John, squeeze my fingers. Squeeze my fingers, John. John, move your toes. John, can you feel that? All right, John. There's been no improvement at all since the tabby finished, so um, unfortunately it looks, you know, that he's had a neurological event. We've done all the tests to try and minimise the risk and, uh, you know, we didn't really think that his risk of stroke was going to be any higher than any other patient. Hi, it's Dr Malik here in the cath lab. I need to be put through to 999 London Ambulance to get a critical care transfer. Time is of essence. Um, if there's going to be any recovery, uh, the complication needs to be dealt with quickly. Uh, they've had an, a stroke. We need to transfer with critical care transfer to the HAZU at Charing Cross. Yeah, we have a critical transfer from Hammersmith Hospital to Charing Cross Casu. We have a 98-year-old male who had a stroke during a procedure. Oh, hi, it's uh, Dr. Malik here from the Hammersmith Hospital. Unfortunately, there has been a complication during the procedure. And I'd, uh, are you in a position to talk about that? OK, so uh, he's still with us. The problem is we think there's a stroke. So our only hope is that he's in that one third that recover completely and not the one third that do very, very badly. And we can't tell really at this very early stage which, which group he's actually going to be in. All right, okay, sorry the news is not better. No, no, no problem, no problem. Okay, all the best now. Bye now, bye. Hmm. All right, John, we're at the different hospital now. John has been brought to the Trust's hyperacute stroke unit at Charing Cross Hospital. <coughs> I just came with him. Yes. Flip this right arm for me, please. John, your right arm. I know you're trying. Your right arm. Try your best. That one. Can you lift it up? I'm just going to extend your right, your right leg to prevent any bleeding from your groin. Sorry, sir. I'm right. just trying to check how good is your power. You probably had a stroke, we think. Right-sided. Uh, Right-sided weakness. Yeah, there's the artery. Yeah. Um, so yeah. just here, this is the middle cerebral artery, which supplies basically most of the left side of the brain. And you can see here there's a bright uh, spot here, which indicates uh, thrombus, a clot, uh, inside the blood vessel. And that would explain his right-sided symptoms. It's actually a very important part of the brain. So losing that part of the brain would give him a significant uh, neurological deficit. What does that part of the brain do? Well, it's, it's certainly his um, more complex neurological functions, his power, sensation to the right side of his, of, of his body. I think this would certainly be a candidate for thrombectomy. So let's get things moving. Just two hours after his heart procedure, 98-year-old John must now undergo an operation on his brain. We're planning to do a thrombectomy, which is where we go up through the blood vessels in the groin, up past the heart, through the neck, into the blood vessels of the brain. And the plan is to try and grab that clot, fish it out, and hopefully restore the flow of uh, blood um, to that part of John's brain. 
I've heard people describe thrombectomy as a kind of miracle cure to yeah. stroke. Yeah. It is uh, occasions where the stroke is severe. At, at the moment, it's only Monday to Friday, 9 to 5? Absolutely, yes. So what, what happens outside of those hours? Well, these patients are going to do as they have been doing up to now badly, unfortunately. Okay, John, doing really well. Okay, John, you can so we've got a stent deployed where the clot is to try and grab it, and we've also got a big suction catheter to try and suck it at the same time. The older the patient, more twisty the vessels, certainly in someone who is 98. It's very difficult to get all the equipment up there. John, you're doing really well. OK? So if you can see the step, it's a very fine structure. It's like a cylindrical mesh. So, so that's going into the, his So that's brain. going into his brain, into the blood vessel, where the blockage is. And by pulling it back, you're hoping that it's going to catch the clot. Nice and still. You're doing well, sir. So we're uh, quite deep now into the vessels, close to the limits of how far we can go. Ready still, John? The clot has migrated from the major trunk of the artery much deeper into one of the branches. The blockage starts about there. However, the clot probably goes beyond that. So it may not come back. We'll, we'll see what it looks like. like some hard stuff there. Uh, this may well be clot from the heart. It may have um, calcium within it. It's much harder to pull out. Fingers crossed. Ooh. Doing very well, sir. Ooh. I've got a tiny bit of something. OK, John. We've got the clot out. Hopefully you'll feel better in a few minutes, OK? We have uh, some clot stuck at the end of that stent. If you see here, at the end of the tubing, I don't know if you can zoom into this. There's, there's a black bit that's just come off there, a very dark bit. It's obviously blocked a major blood vessel that's applying the left side of his brain. So now you can see that that area of brain before that wasn't filling is now filling. It's amazing you can take that out. Yeah, I mean, it works. When it works, it works very well. It often does. It usually does. All right, sir. All the best. I'll see you upstairs. Okay. Hopefully, John makes a good recovery from this. All right. There's a there's another stroke that's coming in. She's got a Really? Yes. So, okay. another stroke. Let's do it. One in, one out. Can I ask you, let's just have a look at your arms first, Jerry. Can I ask you just to squeeze my fingers as hard as you can? That's it. It's six days since Jerry had his stroke. Lovely. Hard as you can, Jerry. Go on. That's it. Okay, keep going down. We're going to head straight for the doors. To the door. Yeah, just to the doors and then have a touch and then we're going to turn around and go back. Okay. All right. What is it like seeing Jerry walk like that after what's happened to him? It's amazing. Yeah. Sorry. We didn't think you <laughs> Jerry is recovering well. Was thrombolized. It was last Thursday, so he came in a But further test. tests reveal a narrowing of one of the blood vessels that supplies his brain, putting him at risk of another stroke. So we're having a multidisciplinary team meeting with the vascular surgeons and also the stroke team, and we're having to make a decision what we think the best treatment is for Jerry. Is there any indication for carotid endarterectomy? I think we have to look at the benefits. Certain people can benefit from an operation to clear out the narrowing to prevent further strokes. I personally don't think he should have his carotid done. From my viewpoint, I don't think he is clear cut at all as to whether he should offer him surgery or not. I'd quite like to see the patient. I mean, I'll make a judgment. So I'll, I'll go and see him this afternoon and make a plan. Weighing up the risks, because the purpose of doing the operation is to reduce his stroke risk. He could possibly die having the operation. Doctors will let Jerry decide whether he wants surgery or not. Hello, sir. I'm Professor De Davis, and we've just had our meeting to discuss whether you should have 
an operation to reduce the risk of having a stroke or whether we should just carry on with various medicines. I personally think your risks of going on to have an operation are such that it's a very difficult balance. My advice would be that we, you would be better off having the appropriate medicines and see how you get on. Now, do you have any immediate thoughts about what I've said? Okay. We will tell them that that's what is your preference. So all in all, I can in a way say cheerio because there's nothing in a way for me to do. And I will um, get Dr. Hals to come back and see you and go from there. Nice to see you. Okay. And nice to see you again. Okay. I think there are quite a lot of people who have decided, particularly as they get older, that they do not want to have a surgical intervention. It's a known surgical intervention that comes with a given risk and therefore feel that they would like nature to take its, take its course. You've got to sort of weigh up the pros and cons and I think there are a lot of risks regardless in what way you look at it. But I think having an operation, the risk is much bigger. Oh, nice. I tend to agree with Jerry for once. <laughs> cool. You've been sleeping? Hmm? OK. Since her bone marrow transplant, Debbie's blood samples have been sent to the lab every day to see if her brother's cells have taken hold, a process known as engraftment. Hi, Cody from Grand Union Ward. We've got some urgent bloods to be collected, please. So far, the results have yet to show conclusive evidence it's working. I'm just logging on so that I can look at the results of her blood test today. The definition of engraftment is a neutral count of more than 0 0.5 on three consecutive days. If today is also over 0 0.5, then she's winning. Hello, Debbie. Do you know what's been happening with your blood counts? Do you know what they are today? No. I give you the news. Yes. It's 1.8 today. Okay. Which means it's the third day in a row okay. that it's been more than 0 0.5. Yes. Which means you have engrafted. Yes. So your new bone marrow is working. Yes. Yes, yes that's right. Yeah. So. Congratulations. Yeah. You, <laughs> so you and your your team, Team Debbie, <laughs> are doing really well. That is good. It's like a bit, a little bit of magic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. From the patient's point of view, being able to establish normal blood production is a key moment. The transplant has worked, and it has been cured. Look <laughs> at that smile. Exciting. Of course. The first step is that you can go out for a little walk. Yeah. Okay. Is it nice doing that bit of the job? Oh, it's the best bit. <laughs> Overall, in the UK, care of sickle cell in childhood is absolutely excellent and is world class. You came here alive and you are going back alive. That's God for you. Yeah. She's very fond of me and I'm fond of her. I don't think we can live a day apart. What's it feel like to be outside, Dad? Good. <laughs> I like it. It's a bit cold. I was worried and I was considering that perhaps I had um, been a little bit too positive in terms of the way that I presented things to him, that maybe it would have been better if he hadn't had the tabby. Hello. How are you? How are you? I'm too bad. Good. How has your day been? 
He's actually doing remarkably well, I have to say. He has had some initial problems with his speech um, and a little bit with his memory, and actually all of those things seem to be more or less resolved now. <laughs> he seems to be back to his usual self. He is interested in the world again. We were having conversations about who his favourite Prime Minister was and who he thought was the worst Prime Minister he's ever witnessed in his lifetime. We're doing really well. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> When I was training, 65 was the cutoff for older age. That's a young man these days. Yes, it's getting busier, and the patients are getting older because they're surviving longer, which is a success story for UK and the NHS. We've got all these amazing pioneering techniques, um, such as TAVI. But as the population ages, how sustainable is all of this within the current structure of the NHS? so worth it because I get to give her another fighting chance which is beyond something I could ever dream of doing. It means like a new beginning for me and my family so I'm very excited for the future. I think we did make the right decision and his heart apparently is, is working beautifully so I think he has every chance now that he's had the tabby of getting to 100 and if he does my goodness the party will have at that point. Can't wait. <laughs> so we've got a bit of a problem now. Next time. I've finished here at Charing Cross so I'm coming over. With more patients than theatres, surgeons struggle to get their operation started. We will talk about it when I've calmed down. OK, um, I'm going to have to go and tell him. There's a drive to get obese patients treated. So that's 10 cancellations on the list tomorrow already. I think there is a stigmatisation against obesity. I completely disagree with the opinion that obesity is self-inflicted. And the hospital joins forces with others across the country for a live kidney swap. Everything has to happen at the same time. One mistake can screw up the whole thing. Can we please all be quiet? Just let me think a second. What choices would you make when faced with complex healthcare decisions? Visit our interactive pages to find out how you would respond. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash hospital and follow the links to the Open University.